This video is part of a series on a first course in modelling analysis and control and here we're going to look at inverse Z transforms. So the previous video then introduced Z transforms and basically said you could consider this assembled signal as a sequence of impulses and then by exploiting the Laplace transform of an impulse you end up with a Z transform expression like this one here. So y of z is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of y k t z to the minus k. Now we derived a number of um, transforms for common signals and here I've just listed four of those. So most important signals, things like an exponential, and there was the z transform, a constant, here a step of one, there's the z transform, a sine wave, there's the z transform, and a sine multiplied by an exponential. Now, there are others, but I'm not going to dwell on those here. Now, what's an inverse Z transform? This follows the same conceptual approach as for inverse Laplace. What you might want to do is do a partial fraction expansion to express the transform in terms of the forms in the table. So you need a more complete table, including cosines and other things, and basically ask yourself, how do I rewrite my Y of Z in terms of the forms that are in the table. Because once I've got it in terms of the forms in the table, the inverse transform is by inspection. Now, we need to emphasize here that the core behaviors are determined solely by the poles. And often it's enough to only determine the poles in order to characterize the behaviors. So a full partial fraction expansion is rarely needed in practice. If you need to get numerical behaviours, get your computer out, because this is not something you want to do on pen and paper. Let's do some examples then of partial fraction expansions. Now, what we're going to say here is that you should be confident in the principles and the process of doing a partial fraction expansion. But in practice, once you're more experienced, you're not going to do these on pen and paper unless you're mad, because they're just tedious. So here's an example. I've got this transform here for y of z. And what I want to do is represent it in terms of the forms in the table. Now I can see by factorising the denominator that it's got two simple factors and therefore the partial fraction expansion will separate into these, these two forms here, which you will recognise both represent exponential components. So now by inspection from the table, I can write that y of k is going to be capital A, 0.8 to the power k, plus capital B, 0.4 to the power k. Now, you might want to know what A and B are. So what you could do is you can multiply out both sides of the equations and then equate coefficients of z, uh, sorry, of z to the 0 and z to the minus 1, and you will end up with two simultaneous equations from which you can solve for A and B. And plug them in. And now you have your answer. This one's slightly more complicated. You'll see it's now cubic. And the other thing you're going to notice is if you look at this particular factor here, you'll see it has complex roots. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is ask myself, well, how do I deal with complex roots? What sort of forms appear in the table? So first of all, I'm going to recognize that this quadratic factor needs to be rewritten like this if I'm going to match it to the forms in the table. So you can see the 0 0.4 is going to match an e to the minus a t cos omega t terms and 0 0.8 is going to match the e to the minus 2 a t. So I can solve for e to the minus a t using that expression and I can solve for cos omega t then using that expression. So what I've done now is I've looked at the table, I've exploited the information in the table and rewritten my transform accordingly. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to do my partial fractions and I can see for the quadratic factor I could have an exponential times a sine or an exponential times a cosine. So I put the appropriate numerator for the sine, the appropriate numerator for the cosine, and then I have also have my term on the right-hand side for the simple um, pole. Now, once I've got suitable A, B and C, I can do the inverse Z transform by inspection because I've now got the forms that are in the table. But here's the key point. 
you can see immediately that this is quite tedious. I haven't even solved for A, B and C and you're already bored. Um, so in general, if you need to do this, I would suggest you use a computer and would also say, do a few examples by hand to get confident that you know what's going on and thereafter just use the computer. So often for engineering design, it's sufficient to characterize the underlying signal. So find the position of the denominator roots. These roots correspond to specific signals, as you will see in the table, and thus the behaviors are known, even if the residues are not. So it's enough often just to factorize the denominator. And you will have seen that to some extent, those two examples, that's exactly what I did. I first of all looked at the denominator in order to work what sorts of signals I had. And in fact, the tedious bit was finding the residues and often that can be skipped. Convolution then. So convolution is another way for doing inverse um, Z transforms. And this is something you will often want to use when the transform you've got is a product of several transforms. So the key thing here is the focus now is on numerical values, not analytic values. We want to find a number for y, k of t. So how might we do that in, in principle? Well, if I gave you a transform like this and I said, I actually want y, k of t, then what you would do is you say, well, OK, I know that I could rewrite this as a series. So there it is. And I also know that the original definition for a, a z transform expressed it as a series. So all I need to do, do now is match these two series the definition and the series that I've got. And by matching those two, you can see straight away that YKT is capital A and then small a to the power K. So this is how we're going to extract numerical values in general. We're going to basically exploit this original definition and write our transform as a series. Next thing you need to note is polynomial multiplication. What happens if I asked you to multiply two polynomials? And you can see I've done an example here. And these aren't particularly high order. It's already a little bit tedious. The question you need to look at is what pattern can you see for the coefficients of the nth power? So let's look at the pattern. What you'll see is in order to get this coefficient down here, cf, I've taken the coefficient of the north power here and the coefficient of the north power here. So north times north gives me the north coefficient. What about the next one? This coefficient in here. You'll see what I've done is I've taken the north coefficient from one and the first coefficient of the other and the first coefficient multiplied by the north. So you've got basically the f times the b and the c times the e. What about the second coefficient? I've taken north times second, first times first, second times north. OK, so that's this middle one in here. And is there a general pattern? You can see that the nth coefficient is the sum of the products of coefficients from the original polynomials such that the power adds to n. Now, I'm not going to prove that. You can obviously do that in your own time. But this is polynomial multiplication. Now, what's convolution? If I ask you to find y k of t, where y is a product of h times u, and then I recognize that h is an infinite sequence and u is an infinite sequence, what do you notice? OK, I can multiply this out. So you'll see I've put brackets here. I've multiplied one sequence by the other sequence, and that's going to give me a new sequence. And what does this look like? This looks like polynomial multiplication. OK, the polynomials are here, are in negative powers of z. But apart from that, that's all it is, polynomial multiplication. So you can work out ynt, so that corresponds to this left-hand side, by basically doing this summation here. And if you're asking where's that summation come from, you'll see essentially what we've done is we've looked at the coefficients. We've got k, we've got n minus k. And we basically said those two coefficients have to add to n, and that gives me the nth over here. Now, I'm not going to do this slowly because this is meant to be a quick video, but in essence, that's convolution. So an example. Convolution requires for all possible n, and that's the key point. I've only done a single n here, but you have to do this for all possible n, these summations. And this is clearly tedious 
and not a pen and paper exercise in general. So use a computer. You can do some on pen and paper if you like, but rather you than me. And MATLAB has got very convenient tools such as conf.m, which do this very quickly and easily. What about inverse transforms by recursion? So recursion is the tool more often, most often used within computer code. And again, we need you to understand the principles and do some simple examples before resorting to the computer. The basic idea is to represent the Z-transform by an equivalent time series model or difference equation and then solve repeatedly for successive sampling instance. So what we're going to use is this basically understanding here that if you do z to the minus 1 yk essentially that means y k minus 1. So if I've got a relationship between transforms 1 plus a z to the minus 1 y of z equals u of z I can replace that by an equivalent difference equation that yk plus a y k minus 1 equals u k. So let's consider this example. We've got a signal y of z you can see it's been given here in the top right hand side and I want to find the individual values for y of k. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the equivalent difference equation and you'll see I've essentially multiplied up the y by the denominator and left the 2z inverse on the right hand side and essentially the 2z inverse is replaced by 2 delta k minus 1 where delta is an impulse function. So now that I've got that difference equation I can write it at several sample instants. So first I write it at the first sample instance and I can use this to solve for y of 0. Having solved for y of 0 I can write the same difference equation at the next sample instant. I can substitute the value of y0 in here and now I can solve for y of 1. Having got y of 1 I can write the same difference equation at the next sample instant and you see I can now substitute in the values of y of 1 the value y of 0 and I can get y2 and then so forth and you'll see the key thing here is successive you start at the first sample instant then you do the second once you've done the second you can do the third once you've done the third you can do the fourth so this is a recursion so here's a different example where you see I've got y equals some transfer function times an input u so again if I multiply up by the denominator left and right and create the relevant difference equation you see the difference equation is here and hopefully it's obvious where that's come from the 0 0.8 the 0 0.4 and the 0 0.1 have gone here here and here and the 2 and the minus 1 there have gone here and here so basically I re-represent it as a difference equation and then I do my recursion at the subsequent sample instance in order to work out first y0, then y1, then y2, then y3. You will also note that in order to do this I need to know the values of the input because they're coming in on the right hand side. Find a value theorem then. Sometimes we're interested mainly in the asymptotic value of a signal. So given y of z, here using the full definition, all I'm interested in is the limit as k goes to infinity of y k t. Now we know from our study of Laplace that, and you'll see I emphasize here ignoring divergent signals, I don't want to get distracted by that, if you have an exponential it's going to converge to zero. If you have a sinusoid it doesn't converge, it just oscillates forever. If you have an exponential times a sinusoid it converges to zero. If you have a step here a over 1 minus z inverse it converges to A. So here's a simple summary for you. Where it exists, we're not considering divergent signals and we're not going to consider sinusoids. The final value is zero if there's no pole at one. So you see this pole is not at one, these poles are not at one, but if the pole is at one then you can get a finite steady state value. So that's the basic characterization before we start. Now, what does the final value theorem say? And we're not going to prove this. You can do that in slow time if you're interested. It says the limit as k goes to infinity of y of k is the limit as z goes to 1 of z minus 1 y of z. And re-emphasize this formula is only valid if the limit exists. So check the limit exists first. And just as a hint for you, if you're multiplying by z minus 1, then clearly anything which hasn't got z equals 1 as a factor in the denominator 
is now going to go to zero when you set z equal to one. So here's an example. Find the final value of the signal with this transform. And all I do is plug in the final value theorem. So there it is. I do the limit as z tends to one of z minus one times y of z. Now as z goes to one, then z minus one is going to go to zero. So I'm going to end up with zero times two of 0 0.12 is zero. You can see this function or transform does not have a pole at one. And so by inspection, the limit is going to be zero. What about this one here? Now, this one here, you can see it does have a pole at one. I've done the factorization here so you can see it. Now, when I now apply the final value theorem, there it is, you can see that this factor z minus one is going to cancel this factor here, which is essentially also z minus one. And so you're now going to get a finite limit, which is 0 0.6. So some conclusions. We've introduced three ways of performing an inverse Z transform. Analytic solutions require partial fractions, but in fact, this would very rarely be useful beyond using poles for behavior characterization. Numerical solutions determine specific values for specific time instances. And in general, you're gonna do this using either convolution or recursion. In practice, this is a job for a computer, not something you were gonna do on pen and paper. And we've also emphasised that if you only want the asymptotic value, you can do this efficiently using a final value theorem. Now, I should also finish by emphasising this video is deliberately brief, not so much to teach the topic, but to give a quick overview of the key aspects so you can then go away and do more detailed study.